In part two of working with neural networks in SPSS statistics, we're going to focus on changing some of the model parameters and seeing what effect that has upon the model outputs and the accuracy. So returning to SPSS statistics, you'll remember that in the previous example, we were running with pretty much the default settings when building a multi-layer perceptron neural network model, but that every time we ran it, we got slightly different results and that's, that's the effect of uh, having a, a random partition for training and test groups defined randomly every time we run it. So we're not using the same training cases from one sample to the next, we're not using the same uh, testing cases from one run to the next. And if we want to control that, we can actually create our own partition variable so that the same cases are used randomly for training and the same cases that are used randomly for testing. And to do that, we're just going to go to file and create, run a bit of syntax here to create that variable. So I'm gonna compute a variable just simply called partition. And that's going to be equal to, or based on a random function, which is just a random variable uniform function here, you can see. And that's gonna create a random uh, sequence of values running from one to 100. And I'm going to use a little Boolean compute here so that values greater than 30 belong to one group and values which are 30 or less belong to another group. If I run that and come back to my data, there's my partition variable there. If we just check it, look at the script of statistics, we can see it's, it's not quite uh, th uh, 30, 70, but it's pretty close to it, 28.9 to 71.1. One will be our training group, zero will be our testing group. Let's delete the output and then return to our multi-layer perceptron dialog that we used earlier on. And we'll go back through uh, the settings here. You can see partition is now an additional variable. We're not gonna use it here, but if we go to partitions, we can say no, use the partitioning variable partition. And that means that every change that we make uh, downstream here, it will always be using the same uh, training and test sample. So we can see the effect, if you like, uh, of, uh, of changing the architecture and the settings within the model build. If I click OK, let's let's run with the default again and see, use that as a sort of uh, a comparison, a stand, a start point. We can see here that um, uh, the training test split is roughly 70-30 and we can see the accuracy here 18.3% incorrect in the testing group, 19.6% actually incorrect in the training group. Uh, very similar results that we saw earlier on. Uh, once again, income, uh, as we saw the very first time we ran, is marginally better than age. It's slightly more important. Um, and that's our that's our standard model. So let's return to, to, uh, to the dialogue. And we can go back to the data and rerun this procedure again, but this time, just playing around a little bit of the architecture of the of the network itself. So we'll go and call up multi-layer perceptron again. If I go to architecture here, you can see we're using the automatic architecture previously. If I click on custom architecture, one of the things that we can do is we can actually ask for two hidden layers rather than one. One is the default. We can ask for two. Um, that makes the model slightly more complex because of course we've got an additional hidden layer here. Does it make a difference to the accuracy of the model? Let's see if we click OK at that point. Reruns it again. Let's look at the uh, case processing summary previously. So it was 28.9% of course, and the model summary here, 19.6% error on the training group, 18.3% error on the testing group. Does that make a difference down here? Ever so slightly, it's 18.4, 19.7, very, very little difference. If we look at the classification table here, and just compare and contrast that classification table flicking back and forth between the previous network and this network. You can see the values here. This is, here's the error we're looking at, 71.59, 72.59. Hardly, hardly any difference at all, but we can see, however, when we look at the actual network itself, that we have an additional uh, hidden layer which has been, been added to it. So that hasn't that hasn't really changed things very much at all here, adding an additional hidden layer. Um, um, would we expect it to make a big difference? Perhaps not, given the fact that this, this is quite an accurate model to begin with. 
but it's something to bear in mind that one can make a, a slightly more complex model uh, by requesting an additional hidden layer. Let's go back and say, okay, let's go back to one hidden layer. Then we have what's called an activation function. Activation function is an abstract concept, but for people who are used to working, for example, with logistic regression, you'll know that this thing called the link function, which converts the coefficients uh, that are produced by logistic regression um, into probability values. The, the coefficients that are produced by logistic regression are in fact the log of the odds. The, uh, so they're not, they're not, they're not like a linear regression coefficients. They don't show a one unit change uh, and the effect of a one unit change on, on, on the dependent variable. Instead, they, they're quite abstract uh, coefficients and they are converted back into probabilities. In a similar sense here, the link between the, uh, the uh, input layer and the, the hidden layer, this, this, this conversion function here is using hyperbolic tangent uh, there's also a conversion function between the uh, the hidden layer and the output itself. That's an activation function as well. And here we even have more of these. We have identity softmax. We're not going to go into all the details of these. But suffice to say, if we wanted to kind of do something more akin to logistic regression, where it uses a sigmoid activation function or something very similar to that, uh, we could click on that. It's a, diff it's a different curve, a different function which converts uh, the relationship between the input variables to the hidden layer. So if I click OK at that point, let's see what effect that has. OK, so now let's look at uh, network information. We're back to one hidden layer. So let's, let's delete our middle one here. So we've got it. We can compare the first and this current setting here. Let's look at the model summary. So here we have overall accuracy 82% versus 80.9%. Whereas previously it was 81.7%, 80.4%. Is it different? It's, it's ever so slightly different. It's a tiny improvement. We can see that the, air, uh, the, uh, the ROC curve doesn't look much different. And the area under the curve here is 0 0.89, whereas previously it's 0 0.889. So it's a tiny difference. But again, this is quite an accurate model. What about the independent variables? Um, income slightly more important in this one than age was previously um, income and age were almost sort of neck and neck so this is a slightly different model but that's the effect of changing that and we can we can play around with the architecture here and, and play around with some of these these functions here to see if they make a difference at this stage not making that that big a difference but something to be aware of that you can play around with these functions and see if they do improve the model bearing in mind of course that in this example we're using exactly the same partition split each time because we've got our partition variable let's look at the training uh, tab this time and see what effect changing some of the settings in there has upon the model we can see that there are three types of training mode the first one is batch that is the default. Do you remember that when a model is being built, it repeatedly updates the weights or, uh, it, and the connections between the input layer, the hidden layer, and the output layer. So it's constantly trying to learn as it's going along. And that is done on a batch basis. Batch here means that these weights are only updated after all the training data, all the records have been passed in a single pass. However, batch training may need to update the weights many times until one of the stopping rules is met. A stopping rule is, is basically where it says, I can't improve the accuracy of the model. And as a result of that, it may need many data passes. So it's quite useful for when you're working with, with smaller data sets. Online, by contrast, updates the synaptic weights after every single training data record is, is, is added, to the, added to the model itself. That is the online training uses information from one record at a time. An online training continuously gets a record and updates the weights until, again, uh, the accuracy can't be improved. If all the records are used and none of the stopping rules are, are met, so it, 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 uh, it can still improve the accuracy, then the process simply continues recycling the data records. Online training is sometimes regarded as quite superior to batch for, for larger data sets with associated predictors. And the last one is, is mini batch, which is kind of a hybrid of the two. It divides, it divides the training data into groups, 
of approximately equal size and then updates the synaptic weights after passing one group a mini batch uh, from uh, from each pass if you like so here we can see for example i could say well i want to pass it in groups of five records at a time let's try online and see what effect that has click ok and again we're looking at the uh, model summary here 81.9% uh, accurate on the testing group compared to 81.2%. How does that compare to previously? 80.9% um, to 82%. So again, uh, ever so slightly uh, different from one to the next is, is an improvement. Not much of an improvement really, but, but no, nevertheless, that is the effect of it. What happens if I rerun that again, but this time using mini batch where we uh, pass groups of uh, five batches of records at a time. Click OK. OK, let's look at the model summary. 81.6% uh, over, overall accuracy on the testing group compared to 80.3% on the training group. What about the area under the curve settings here? Well, the area under the curve here is 0.891, whereas area under the curve here is 0.89 there's really not much difference between one network to the next and again as i say this is quite an accurate model so we're kind of running out of any extra juice that we can squeeze out of it but it is important to bear in mind that these things can can have quite a dramatic effect when when we're trying to deal with quite noisy data let's return to the data and look at some of the additional output that we can create when we run our multi-layer perceptron in terms of additional output, uh, one of the charts that I like to request are cumulative gains charts. I find that these are a little bit more intuitive, particularly when I'm talking to a non-technical audience when I want to explain how well the model's doing. And I can also ask for the synaptic weights themselves if I want to see what these values are that are associated with the loadings on the hidden layer, uh, from the input layer to the hidden layer and from the uh, hidden layer to the output layer I can actually see these values the positive and negative weights themselves if I click OK at that point let's just see the results of that so we're scrolling down here here are the synaptic weights themselves the parameter estimates so these are actually showing me uh, basically they're showing me these values here which are the relationships in these actual lines here the negative the blue the blue negative relationships and the gray positive relationships so we can see, for example, income category one, which is low, what loading that has on H1, the middle, the middle, the first middle node here. And then its relationship to H2 and H3. And that would allow me, for example, if I wanted to recreate this, this model perhaps in, a, in another, in another third party system, I could actually uh, use these parameter estimates to recreate the model itself. They are, of course, fairly obscure. That's the nature of, uh, of a neural network. They're somewhat abstract. We can also see uh, from the hidden layer to the output itself what the coefficients are. And then scrolling down here, we've got our ROC chart that we had beforehand. But now we've got our, uh, our actual um, cumulative response chart. And this is showing us a gain, a gain percentage. And the gain percentage here is telling you what proportion of the goods and bads are you finding uh, against your, your best uh, percentile of the data? So, for example, if I say uh, across my best 50% of the data, first best 50% of the data, what proportion of the, the bad group am I finding? Well, I'm actually getting about 85% of them. And for the good group, what for the best 50% of the good group, um, I'm getting about 75%. It's about, it's about a 10% difference between these in terms of the proportion that I'm capturing. And that's that's reflective of the fact that the group sizes are slightly different. So the baseline is somewhat different. But for example, if I only had a budget to reach out or I wanted to cut off a certain group and say, well, I only want to, I only want to focus on the best 40% or the best 50% of the data. And these are the people that I'm going to, you know, make my make my offers to then this chart is quite, a, is quite a useful way to view that. Lastly, we can just return to the dialog and to show you some of the options on the save here. We can actually save out the variables themselves. So you can say save predicted value or category for each dependent variable. 
and save predicted pseudo probability for each dependent variable pseudo probability because it's it's a machine learning algorithm it's not um it's not actually a, a statistical algorithm if we click ok at that point this reruns the procedure for us uh, we can see we create three new variables here the first one is simply uh, the predicted outcome the category outcome which indicates whether or not people have good or bad credit worthiness and then we have two probability values the probability of being a uh, a bad uh, credit worthiness 0 0.8 0 0.487 here just below 0.5 but probability of being good credit worthiness 0.53 so therefore it gets assigned to good here we have probability of being a bad credit worthiness 0.880% so it gets assigned to bad and so forth and so forth of course we could uh, just choose this uh, column here and say well anybody with a you know a pseudo probability value of greater than 0.3 we can see it is a pseudo probability value because it goes slightly above one here but say say above 0.3 is, is is too risky for us so we're going to only only offer people with a uh, pseudo probability of being a bad uh, uh, credit worthiness category of less than 0.3 and we could use that as a, another selection criteria and the last thing to bear in mind is that we go back to multi-layer perceptor on here if i go to save you can actually uh, say export the model um, as an XML file and use that to score new data. So you could actually give this a name and say, okay, I'm going to score new data here. And then you go to utilities and use scoring wizard and call that, call that model up and use it to score new data. So it's a way of exporting uh, the, uh, the neural network model and applying it to another data set with the, the same input variables.